In this video, we will go through a tour around the world to pick up on specific macroeconomic issues as part of this macroeconomics course introduction. I want to talk briefly about the global financial crisis, the US economy and the Chinese economy. Of course, I will focus on the macro or big picture related to this macroeconomics course. A significant event we start with is the global financial crisis, which took place in 2007 in the United States. However, the shock spread across the world economies and became a global economic shock given the US economy's large size. It is by far the largest economy globally and has several links, trade or financial links with almost every country in the world. So when an economy with this size goes in troubles, it wouldn't be surprising to shake the entire world economy. This graph, for example, shows the world uh, GDP growth rate between 2000 and 2019. Notice the sustained economic expansion between 2000 and 2007. Remember, GDP is a measure of total output, and when growing, it refers to economic expansion or a good time or a boom in the business cycle. However, in 2007, housing prices in the United States began to decline, which led to a significant economic shock in the United States and elsewhere. You can see this on the graph in the form of a sharp dip of the world GDP growth. The US crisis traveled across countries and continents through trade and financial links and led to negative growth worldwide, which continued through to early 2009 in some countries. The red line on this graph shows the growth rate in advanced economies, which shows the devastating effects of the US shock on these economies. In a similar fashion, but to a lesser extent, the blue line shows a negative impact of the US crisis on emerging economies' growth rates. The shock also had adverse effects on major stock markets, as you can see in this graph. Notice how stock prices fell sharply as a result of the global financial crisis. Again, this is not a surprise given the US economy is the largest across the world. It produces nearly 23% of the world output, demonstrating how large the US economy is. A large economy means a higher output level and is usually associated with a higher income level and standard of living. Now let's have a closer look at the US economy and its economic performance in recent history. We could look at GDP growth, unemployment rate, and the inflation rate, the leading macroeconomic indicators. This table shows these indicators before, during, and after the global financial crisis. Before the crisis, the U.S. economy was growing at 3% on average between 19, um, 1990 and 2007. However, the growth rate fell below zero to minus 1.5% because of the financial crisis. It is not surprising to see a high unemployment rate during the crisis. Notice how even after the recovery, the unemployment rate remained high for quite some time, around 8% between 2010 and 2014. These figures highlight the fact that employment takes a bit longer to recover after a recession. But what actions did policymakers take in the U.S. to deal with this crisis? The Fed or the Federal Reserve, the American Central Bank, lowered the interest rate, known as the Fed funds rate. This graph shows how the interest rate became nearly zero by December 2008, trying to boost or push the economy out of recession. This action by the central bank, known as an expansionary monetary policy, 
We will learn more about this later in this course. For now, notice that the interest rate cannot fall beyond zero or be in the negative territory. This constraint is known as the zero lower bound. Why is this the case? Because if the interest rate were negative, everyone would hold cash rather than bonds. Suppose you have two options, holding cash, which is liquid, but has zero returns, or holding bonds, which are less liquid, but yield positive returns. Negative interest rates mean that everyone would prefer zero returns to negative returns. In other words, prefer holding cash over bonds. But why are low interest rates a potential issue? Because it limits the central bank's ability to respond to further adverse shocks. It may also lead to excessive risk-taking behavior by investors to increase their returns. Moving to the Chinese economy. It is the second largest economy globally, which has been growing fast for some time, almost over the last three decades. The size of the Chinese population is four times that of the US population. Many observers believe that it will overtake the US economy leading to a global power shift. As a result, China is a significant economic power. This table shows an incredibly high growth rate, even during the global financial crisis. But does such incredible growth rate implies a high standard of living? Not necessarily. Remember, growth is good, but might not be sufficient. The Chinese growth rate is much higher than that of the US economy. However, this does not necessarily mean that Chinese citizens enjoy a higher standard of living than Americans. So it is imperative to consider who collect the gains from that growth, or in other words, the income distribution. Besides, we should always be careful when interpreting the GDP per capita or any other indicator that uses the average or mean value, as these indicators tend to be influenced by extreme values. To conclude this video, we had a quick tour through the global financial crisis, the US economy, and the Chinese economy. We considered mainly GDP growth, GDP per capita, as well as inflation rate and the unemployment rate. These macroeconomic indicators, which are easy to calculate, are suitable for making cross-country and over time comparisons. However, one needs to be cautious when interpreting GDP per capita and growth rates. Remember, growth is good, but might not be sufficient by itself to lift people out of poverty and raise living standards. It is crucial for an economy to grow, but without leaving large groups of people behind. That's it for this video. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.